with our insect friend and the consequences for non-human organisms. Thank you. Hello. Um, so I know my title is a bit of a mouthful, um, but I want to start to give a little bit of background also about just invasive insects in general. And then let's, uh, let's take a look at other organisms. We've heard a lot of great talks about how in, or, uh, humans are impacted, but let's hear about something else. So I want to start by just talking about why we are, why we're here, why we have more invasive insects than ever in the world today. Um, and so this is a pretty well-known chart. This is just showing population increase over the last 2,000 years. And, um, you know, it's, it's an exponential increase. Uh, even 500 years ago, we had less than half a billion people in the world, and now we're over 7 billion. What's interesting here, though, is we're also seeing the associated um, average GDP per person in the world. So not only do we have ever more people, but they're also richer. They have more resources. Um, and so this has led to uh, an explosion in global trade um, and travel. You can kind of see here uh, some of the hubs, you know, Europe, North America, Eastern Asia um, are really these hot spots where uh, a lot of things are coming out of and going into. Uh, it's also cheaper to send things around the world and for you to travel to another area. Okay, let's keep that in mind. It's also important to think about where uh, cargo is coming from. So we do have uh, live insects coming into our ports from northern Russia or Central Africa, but we don't get those species to often establish because they're not used to our habitat. Um, we get a lot of invasive species from Eastern Asia. This thing is not so great. Um, we get a lot of invasive species from Eastern Asia, and that's because we're both in temperate climates. Um, they, they make it out of their container or out of a piece of pallet wood, what have you, and they're already accustomed to, um, to the other organisms around them. By the way, that is a, a two-way trade there. Uh, they get a lot of invasive insects from us, too. So. This idea of uh, the enemy release hypothesis, this is just talking about how in the natural system, all organisms have uh, enemies in the environment, predators, parasitoids, which keep those populations under check. So this is actually something which we have here on the East Coast. This is an actual system here. Um, Halimorpha hyas is the brown marmorated stink bug. Uh, that's an invasive pentatomid species. And in its native range, uh, in Eastern Asia, it has uh, specialist parasitoids, which keep those populations under check, keep them low. Uh, there's generalist predators, which will occasionally feed on it if they come across it, though they're not specializing on it. And here we have our native conspecific. This is the brown stink bug. Well, here in North America, we have specialist parasitoids. We have those generalist predators. And when these two meet, they have a lot of overlapping hosts. So this is soy, for instance. Um, but here, we don't have that parasitoid anymore. Um, and so there's a, a disproportionate amount of pressure on our native stink bugs because now they're sharing their food source with something which does not have those population level controls. Um, and so we get an increase in the invasive species um, and an out-competition of the native species. Now I want to talk about two types of introductions very broadly. I want to say intentional and unintentional. We introduce non-native species all the time. It's called classical biocontrol. Uh, something like the multicolored Asian lady beetle has been introduced into the United States for a long time in many different uh, places. We, it's a voracious aphid eater, so we introduce it to control uh, agricultural aphid pests. We also release it still in uh, Virginia to control larval gypsy moth populations, um, but it has detrimental effects also. Uh, this is the one that comes into your house this time of year. Our native ladybugs don't do that. Uh, it also is outcompeting a lot of other native species. So that's an intentional one. Unintentional are often the ones we hear a little bit more about. Something like Asian longhorn beetle. This is a most robust uh, beetle. It, it gets into hardwood trees. It's, it originates from Eastern Asia. It gets into hardwood trees. It gets into the heartwood of the tree. Uh, and the larvae are able to actually survive the milling process. So you cut those trees down after they've been infested. You turn them into um, uh, pallet material. And then you stick big cargo containers on it and send it across the ocean. And the larvae are still alive, ins uh, alive inside that wood. They're able to emerge out on the other side of the world and establish populations. We have Asian longhorn beetle still breeding in the United States, in Ohio and Worcester, Massachusetts. We had it in New Jersey, but it took us seven years and we eradicated it. About two years ago, we officially said, we don't have to, we don't have to worry about this pest anymore. So, unintentional. We didn't, we didn't mean to bring them here. 
I'm gonna have to take a minute and give lip service, especially because where we are, uh, we're right by Newark, the Port of Elizabeth, um, to all of our ports of entry. These are the, the major ways which invasive species are coming into any portion of the world. These are the, the 25 largest ports we have in the United States. Um, and in fact, the Port of Elizabeth is the third largest port. It imports over 60 million tons of cargo every year. And USDA APHIS, bless their heart, are responsible for uh, trying to check every single one of those containers. These containers can be half the size of this room, and they're looking for insects. So you can imagine it's not a question of if we're getting introductions. It's a question of, OK, what's being introduced? Um, and, and, and when's the next one going to come in? So uh, we're, we're constantly getting these. And the reason I'm not putting any airports on there is because world trade is firmly on the back of sea travel. 90% of cargo uh, moves around the world on a ship. So we're still very much so dependent on these ports. Um, and we get a lot of introductions through them. I want to take another second to clear up a misnomer. I don't like the term invasive species. I like to think of them as invasive populations. Um, and let's define those really quickly by saying, an invasive population is one which is no longer sufficiently regulated by local environmental controls and is now causing uh, economic and ecological damage. Let's take a look at Cyrex wood wasp to illustrate this. It's native to Eastern Europe, uh, or it's native to Europe um, and Northern Russia, and it's not an invasive. It's not an invasive population there. Uh, many natural enemies keep it under control. It still kills a couple pine trees, but nothing out of the ordinary. Um, other areas of the world, like the southern tip of Africa, uh, eastern Australia, and parts of South America where it's been introduced, we now, we now call it an invasive population because it doesn't have those local controls. We actually now have this in uh, New York as well. But, um, you know, this is an invasive population. The whole species is not invasive. And also, invasive populations can be either native or non-native. We're used to hearing about ones that are both invasive and non-native, things like the glassy-winged sharpshooter, first discovered in, in central California in the mid-1990s. Um, it's a serious problem. It actually transmits a bacteria that causes Pierce's disease. And so uh, this is a symptomology you get in grapes. We're right by Napa Valley here, by the way. Uh, so there's a lot of energy being put into trying to suppress this pest and keep it under control. But we understand systems like this. It invaded from somewhere else, and now it's starting to go, uh, it's starting to move out of control. Things that are invasive and native um, are, are a little bit less common, but can be equally destructive. This is a southern pine beetle. Um, fascinating little insect. It, we have it in southern Jersey here. This is actually a picture from the Pine Barrens. This beetle is able to kill large swaths of pine trees in, in, in a very short period of time. And what's really neat about it is, uh, is how it does it. So imagine you're a pine tree. Uh, if a beetle tries to bore through your bark, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to allocate all the sap and resin you can to that area and tsunami over. You will basically just flood the beetle out of that hole and drip it down the side of your trunk. So these guys decided that they well, decided these guys um, transmit something called a blue stain fungus. It gets into the tree and it clogs up the vascular tissue, and the tree is no longer able to move its liquid resources around like it needs to. Uh, suppresses the immune defense, and beetles are able to quickly colonize the tree. So it, it can move very quickly through a forest, um, but it's native, you know. Now, uh, whether or not we're talking about um, humans, no. whether we're talking about humans and fleas and uh, Euschistes pestis, or we're talking about um, you know uh, birds and mosquitoes and uh, avian malaria, the transmission triangle or the basic schematic of transmission remains the same. You must have the host, you must have the pathogen, and you must have the vector at all times. You can break transmission by stopping any portion of this. And you can have either abiotic or biotic factors stopping that. Something like a biotic factor might be increased predation on the vector. Um, so, you know, there's just such a low population, you don't have to worry about them anymore. Abiotic factors might be something like climate. You don't get a huge, you don't get many um, uh, insect vector diseases in the dead of winter because either the insect is not in a life stage which transmits that disease or the population is in diapause or whatever. Um, to illustrate this, I want to look at a specific example, one that I just mentioned, which is avian malaria in Hawaii. 
Avian malaria is a really interesting, um, it's a really interesting disease, but it's also not a problem for birds in most parts of the world. Birds evolved with it. Um, they've developed resistance to it. Uh, it's, it's kind of a, a background thing. I mean, it, it's not something which, um, which, you know, reaches epidemic proportions most places. But in Hawaii, Hawaii never had mosquitoes. Um, Quilix quinquiciatus was anthropogenically um, transported to Hawaii in 1826 when ship captains had um, drinking water that had uh, breeding populations of these mosquitoes in it. So when they came to, uh, to Hawaii, they introduced this novel uh, vector for the first time, and all of a sudden these birds had to deal with it real quick. Uh, Hawaii, by the way, has the highest rates of avian extinction of anywhere else in the world. Since 1980, over 10 novel species have already become extirpated from this area. Um, and so these uh, passeriform birds are the, you know, the ones which are most affected. This is going to be your honey creepers, uh, the Hawaiian crow. And Plasmodium relictum is the main type of malaria that I want to talk about. Like human malaria, there are different strains which cause the symptomology of avian malaria. Um, but this is, this is the big one in Hawaii. So these birds uh, have contact with this uh, pathogen, which is um, very deadly to them. And you know what do they do? Well, Hawaii is an interesting system. Hawaii is a hot spot, and so it's incredibly uh, mountainous. You have uh, incredible changes in elevation over a very, very uh, small scale of land. And with that, you can see that this is kind of a temperature representation. Here's the, the topo maps. It's obviously colder at the top of the mountains. Um, and we have a, a lot of warmer areas here around the base. So the uh, birds have actually used this to their advantage to try and break the transmission triangle. Um, here we can see uh, a study from 2002 by Ripper et al. Uh, and on the bottom here, I'm looking at uh, increasing elevation. In amber, I have my mosquito populations, and you can see that I have a lot higher uh, prevalence of mosquitoes at the base of the mountain there. As I move up in elevation, suddenly it switches. Now I have a huge um, populations of these native birds. And where they meet, where I have sufficient populations of both the mosquitoes and the birds, I now have my highest levels of transmission. Once I get higher up in the mountain, it's too cold for the mosquitoes to breed quick enough um, and actually transmit the disease. And so these birds have spatially, or have spatially separated themselves uh, from the transmission of this disease. Now, it's not exactly fast enough. Uh, we would like to be a little bit more proactive than just waiting for the ecology to sort of balance itself out. So we step in and we identify populations of birds which are becoming resistant to this disease, and we steal their eggs and we try and put them in lower elevation areas to reestablish um, breeding populations. Really fascinating system. I want to now move away from uh, avian malaria to a different type of system. I want to talk about emerald ash borer killing trees. So emerald ash borer uh, is an invasive bupresbid species. Uh, we first identified it in the United States in 2002, and it's sort of spread out from southern Michigan. You'll see that in a second. But it's, it's uh, primarily the larva which cause damage. Um, it feeds in the cambium layer of the tree. And in four to five years, they can take a healthy ash tree and completely kill it. Um, it works by girdling the tree. A single emerald ash borer larva feeding in this area is not really going to cause any damage, this thing. Um, but as the population increases and you get more and more of those galleries weaving around the tree, they'll overlap. And eventually, it's the same thing as me taking a pocket knife and walking around the tree and just cutting a strip of bark out. Uh, the tree no longer has any ability to move um, nutrients and water from its roots up past wherever that girdle line is. So like many invasive species, we can map how it moves. And we can see how the infestation has actually um, distributed itself across America. And much like any other invasive species, it establishes and it starts to pool outwards. That makes sense. That's kind of what we expect, this sort of amorphous blob just continuing to send out its tentacles. But when we look at exactly where those populations are found in each of these areas, we can, we can really detect that this pest isn't just moving of its own volition. We are still transporting it around, even within this area. So when we see things like these little satellite populations here, and then we realize, oh my gosh, these are campgrounds. 
This insect is still being moved around by people inside firewood. It's also a hitchhiker pest. It moves around on big rigs down the roads. These things track with highways. It also gets moved around by people through infested nursery stock. So uh, we set up quarantines whenever we find emerald ash borer in an area, and we say, don't you dare move wood out of there. Uh, but not everyone listens to us. We had set up quarantines, and then um, Maryland and Virginia actually received shipments of infested ash tree nursery stock from inside the quarantine area, and the population established and started to spread out from there again. So uh, in New Jersey, we found it this last year. We found four separate locations uh, over three counties. And this is an interesting little diagram because uh, you can actually see the prevalence of ash trees um, we have more in northern Jersey, and so obviously those are the areas we're more concerned about. So what might be the ecological impacts of emerald ash borer in these areas? Let's break those impacts into two separate categories, direct and indirect. The direct impacts of an invasive species are often quite straightforward. Um, we have 282 species that feed on ash trees. They're going to get hungry because they no longer have a food source which they're accustomed to. And at this point, I know that a couple of you might be thinking in your head, okay, John, you, you keep saying ash trees, and that's a pretty broad category. Which ash trees? All of them. Emerald ash borer does not discriminate. It's most, blue ash is most resistant, but it will kill green, pumpkin, uh, all types of ash that we have in this country. So uh, 282 species, quite obviously affected. 43 species that we know of are absolutely dependent on ash trees for one or more of their life stages. And so these are becoming um, locally extirpated in the areas which emerald ash borer moves through. Because emerald ash borer kills nearly all the trees, um, if not all of the trees in a forest, um, all the ash trees in a forest. And a lot of ash forests um, can be predominantly ash. So something like the banded ash clearwing borer here uh, is, is dying out in many areas just because it no longer has the resources to reproduce. Indirect effects are subtly more complicated, but quite interesting. Um, when emerald ash borer moves through an area and it's killing these ash trees real quick, four to five years, what you get is large gaps in the forest canopy, and that allows a lot of light to come in, um, and that has a, a, a lot of weird effects on a forest. Other invasive species are able to establish and take advantage of those forest gaps. Something like mile a minute, another invasive species we have here in New Jersey. Um, is uh, specifically uh, takes over areas like this. You get a small gap in the forest, a couple of the surrounding trees weren't ash so they survived, except now mile a minute weed comes in, overtakes those species, and you know, because of emerald ash borer, other species of trees are now dying in the area also. Um, you also dramatically change the successional trajectory of a forest. Uh, you know, oftentimes we're talking about climax forests here, um, and you change the nutrient cycling, you change the soil moisture when you get these uh, large dead standing trees, and you know, it, it has, uh, it's called a, a trophic cascade, and it just uh, it, it affects everything else in that system. A specific one that I want to talk about is uh, the giant swallowtail prickly ash system. Now prickly ash is so named because it has compound leaves which um, somewhat resemble ash trees, but it's not a true ash. Uh, it, it's not a true ash. It's not something which emerald ash borer actually feeds on, but it is oftentimes in the forests which emerald ash borer moves through. It's just uh, um, a shrub layer um, species. So the giant swallowtail butterfly, um, the caterpillars feed on prickly ash, uh, and that's they need to in order to develop. Um, and normally, you know, they're really one of the few animals that gets to feed on prickly ash because it, uh, this plant uses franocoumarins as a defense compound. Um, here you can see those. What's neat though is this plant actually upregulates its production of these compounds um, in response to higher light conditions. So when you start to get gaps in the forest canopy, more light gets down to the shrub layer. The prickly ash upregulates its production of franocoumarins it now takes longer for the giant swallowtail butterfly caterpillars to detoxify those compounds. So it takes longer for them to develop, and that increases the amount of time that they are able to be um, uh, predated upon or susceptible to various parasitoids. So indirectly, um, as emerald ash borer moves through the area, we can see a decline in the giant swallowtail butterfly species. Quite an indirect effect, though. So I really want to summarize uh, with an end on two different points.
The first is when a population becomes invasive, there are a myriad of potential impacts to the ecology of the surrounding environment. Not all of them are immediately bad. Things like woodpeckers and uh, cavity nesting birds are actually doing quite well for themselves after uh, emerald ash borer moves through an area. There's more food for them, there's more nesting habitat for them. Um, it's not likely that that'll necessarily stay that way. But, uh, you know, for right now, some populations are actually increasing as a result. Other populations, you can argue definitely the majority, are decreasing. Um, they're adversely affected. And there's something you can do about it. This is hemlock woolly adelgid. Uh, it's been established on the eastern coast for 60 years or so. And this is a group in Maine which trains private citizens to go out and identify early signs and symptoms of uh, hemlock woolly adelgid infestations. It is critical that uh, we do this everywhere. New Jersey Department of Agriculture also does things like this um, because there's too many trees out there for uh, some regulatory agency to go out and um, survey every forest. It's never going to happen. So the majority of infestations end up being reported by private citizens. They say, you know what, I, I just, I don't know what this is, but I haven't seen it here before. Uh, can you guys come and take a look at it? And we say, oh, wow, it's an Asian longhorn beetle. We're going to get right on that. Um, and so, you know, be vigilant. Uh, it's, it's, good to, uh, it's good to familiarize yourself with some of these species. And lastly, I kind of want to uh, at least bring up our, our most recent introduction. That's the spotted wing, or the spotted lanternfly. Um, this was just found this past September in eastern Pennsylvania. It's a highly prolificous uh, uh, pest. It feeds on many, many, many different types of plants. It does transmit plant diseases. We've quarantined the areas that we're in. We'll see how that works. And we don't really know what the effects are going to be quite yet. You really never know. Uh, Ask us in five years, and we can retroact, and we can look back and say exactly what it did. But um, you know, keep an eye on it. So with that, I would like to thank my graduate advisor, Dr. George Hamilton, the Rezento Department, and uh, the NJDA Division of Plant Industry. And I think we are about to start our question portion of tonight. So thank you.